Yatin sir is also here, sir. Hello, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Kushamdeed, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Dhru. Nice to see you. Same here, sir. I hope your flight is on time, sir. I am traveling. I know, sir. You are at the airport or you are still there? I am there? at the airport. Yeah, sir, but I'm three, gone, I two, one. We are live now. Okay. Parish, let's start. Muted. Parish, you are on mute. So, yes, sir. Can we start? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. So, very good evening, team, and uh, very good evening to both, uh, both our course directors, sir, Yatin Mehta, sir, and Dhruv Chaudhary, sir. And uh, special thanks to Rakhi, ma'am, for considering our invitation. And uh, very thankful to Dr. Omkar, sir, as well as uh, Dr. Ayush, sir, for connecting us because they have done a wonderful job regarding this, all the case preparation and this, all the thing. So this is the 13th episode of Pulse of Critical Care. Uh, we have started in the month of Jan 2023. So every month on the third Friday we are doing, but because of some challenges for this third Friday, we have shifted to this uh, 20th fair. So these are our two course director, Yatin Mehta, sir, and uh, Dhruv Chaudhary, sir. We'll start now and uh, we'll try to end up this session around uh, 9 p.m. So, first of all, we'd like to introduce our first course director, Dr. Yatin Mehta. Sir, sir is the chairman at uh, Medanta Institute of Critical Care and Anesthesiology, Institute of Critical Care and Anesthesia, Medanta, the Medicity Gurgaon. Pioneer, sir, is the pioneer in the critical care and the cardiac anesthesia in India. Trend at UCMS and AIMS New Delhi, India, Queen's University, Nottingham, UK, and the Odense University Hospital, Denmark. Sir started Escort Heart Institute Department of Critical Care and Anesthesia. And then after 20 years, he has moved to establish the same specialties at the Medanta, the Medicity. Sir is the president of uh, Sepsis Forum of India, Simulation Society, the past chairman of SWAC Al Alasco, past president of ISCM IACTA. Sir is the teacher and teacher of all the medical fraternity as well as uh, intensives as well as the anesthesia is concerned. As far as award and achievement, sir is the medical doctor of the year in the year 2010, Vasista Chikitsa Ratna Award in 2012, Dronacharya Award in 2019, and the Guardian of Health Award in 2021. So, sir, we welcome you all for this uh, because you are having very busy schedule, but out of that, you have spared some time for us. So, thank you very much, sir. And our second course director, Dr. Dhruv Chaudhary, sir. Sir is the senior professor and uh, head of the Department of Pulmonology and Critical Care at the reputed PGI Rohtak. Sir is the president of Association of Commonwealth Scholar and the Fellow. Sir has established the Department of PCCM in his institute alumnus of PGI Chandigarh as well as PGI Rotak, awarded prestigious Commonwealth Academic Staff Award Fellowship in Pulmonology in 2009. Sir has supervised 30 postgraduate in medicine and allied subject, four postdoctoral fellow. Sir has written more than 42 papers in national and international journals and 38 chapters in book. Sir has edited a monograph on antibiotic uses and abuses. Sir is a past, past vice chancellor of Indian College of Critical Care Medicine. He was the past general secretary of ISCM and was its accreditation for the coordinator for the four years. So we welcome you, Dhruv Chaudhary, sir, also. And now I would like to request Dhruv Chaudhary, sir, to introduce Rakhi Ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mehta, sir, and uh, Dr. Uh, and, and uh, Parish, and also all my friends from INTAS who have helped us supporting running this program successfully. And without the guidance of Dr. Mehta, it would not have been possible. Uh, we have been working as a team. And sir has been very kind and uh, large-hearted to allow me to involve into it. And I think we decided, both of us, that we need to have institutions coming and taking their experiences to the people in the field, what they're doing. And I think in hepatology, no institute is better than today, ILBS. And Dr. Rakim Aywal has been 
spearheading the intensive care unit in ILBS since its inception or maybe a little later. She especially has a special interest in critical care hepatology, renal patients, liver failure and artificial support therapy. She is also the vice secretary of the International Club of Ascites, which again is a unique thing. And obviously she has published original articles in number of them, more than 150 publications and 12 book chapters. She at present is the professor of hepatology and head of the liver intensive care unit. I think we cannot have a more distinguished person then and experienced person than Ra Dr. Raki in uh, liver, uh, in uh, intensive care or critical care of uh, patients who are having a liver illness or a cardiac illness. So before I over to it, a quick word from Dr. Mehta because he, I think he has to take a flight. Also, said Dr. Mehta said quickly and then we go over to Dr. Raki and we start it up. Thank you, Dr. Dhruv, for taking over this responsibility. And I thank you, Dr. Raki, for uh, taking on again the presentation of the cases and the discussion. We couldn't have found a better person to do that. And I should, uh, she got two young colleagues to present the case and we take it forward. It's an important issue, particularly in India, not only alcoholic, but non-alcoholic uh, cirrhosis. Fatty liver is a major problem in India. And I think um, we'll have a, a fruitful discussion um, uh, during this year. Thank you very much again. Rakhi, now it's your field along with your two students. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dhruv and Dr. Mehta, for uh, this uh, opportunity to given to me. And uh, I'm really thankful because it's a big platform for me to discuss here and show and uh, with the unique audience also over here about cases of acute liver failure. And uh, I have with me two very bright residents uh, who are now in the third year of the DM course in the hepatology. And I just checked with them. They have uh, actually, uh, they have seen uh, and have been with me in the ICU for almost four to five months in their posting of two years, which they have done. So doc Dr. Omkar will be the first resident who will be taking up the case. And uh, Dr. Omkar Rudra is a MBBS from Kim's University, Narkat Pali. And uh, he has done his MD medicine from Belga. And Dr. the second uh, bright resident, uh, who's also my, uh, who's doing the thesis also with me is Dr. Ayush. And he's from KMC Manipal. And he did his MD medicine from RNT Medical College, Udaipur. So uh, the, the, what we'll do here quickly is uh, the, the residents, our fellows will take up uh, two very interesting cases with different management. So there were a lot of hiccups which we faced during the management of these two patients. So the first one will be a more longer case which we'll discuss and the second one will be a short snippet just to show uh, the kind of patients uh, that we can have in acute liver failure of different presentations. So we'll go over from here to Dr. Omkar if the group allows us. Thank you, ma'am. At the outset, I would like to uh, thank Raki ma'am uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. I would also like to thank the course directors, Yatin sir and Dhruva sir, for uh, having us on this uh, prestigious platform to discuss uh, issues regarding hepatology. I would like to begin by, I'll just share my screen. Parish, please tell the technical team to help him out. I think on Oprah has been dikkat hori hogi. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Support him. Just check Share time. screen. Uh, green button is there, sir. So just you open your uh, uh, presentation first yes, and then uh, go into the share screen. Uh, can you, if you have these slides, Mr. Parish, you can. 
Yes, yes, definitely. I'm I'm having that slide. Ankar, usko band karke dobara kar lo yar. Two minutes mein ho jayega. That sometimes is the one. Wo share hone mein dikkat ho rahi hai kya? I'm sorry, just. No, get in it. कोई बात नहीं नाम से यू लॉग आउट लॉग इन अगेन अपनी पहले खोल लो उसपे और देन यू लॉग इन ये शायद सर को वहां से अलाउ नहीं कर रहा है ऐसा कुछ है क्या चेक कर लेते सर कैन आई शेयर बेटर कोई बात नहीं एक बार कर ले सर स्क्रीन इज विजिबल नो दिस इज नॉट हाँ दिस इज विजिबल नो इज़ द राइट प्रेजेंटेशन सर मैं आयुष सर है सेंड मी दिस टू प्रेजेंटेशन फर्स्ट वन इज ऑफ ओमकार सर एंड सेकंड वन इज ऑफ इफ यू परमिट देन अदरवाइज आई स्टॉप शेड आयुष these are not these are not the slide ayush onkar is when nikal ke bahar karke dobara aa jao andar yes sir it's done sir ha now it will be there yes I'm I'm so sorry for the the delay and the... नहीं, 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 absolutely no issue तो बेटा आगे से उसके काम करेंगे परेश आगे से पहले चेक कर लेना वो basically वो कहीं पे टेक सो आई लाइक टू बिगिन बाई प्रेजेंटिंग द केस ऑफ ट्वेंटी टू ईयर ओल्ड मेल वॉज अदरवाइज हेल्दी हु प्रेजेंटेड टू आई एल बी एस विद कंप्लेन्स ऑफ फीवर फॉर द पास्ट फाइव डेज हाई ग्रेड फीवर विद चिल्स फॉर विच यारेसिटामोल total dose of paracetamol was 1.2 grams which he took over 2 days he also had complaints of yellowish discoloration of eyes which was painless progressive non cholestatic associated with high colored urine two days after this onset of jaundice he also had altered sensorium which was uh, progressive and upon presenting to the hospital to us he was in grade 4 encephalopathy he was being managed at a local hospital outside before being referred to ilbs for further management upon presentation to ilps in the emergency he was found to be hemodynamically stable with a heart rate of 90 bp of 130 by 70 and maintaining his saturation the blood glucose at the time was found to be 100 a quick ivc assessment was done which was found to be 16 mm and more than 50% collapsible his quick sofa was found to be 1 a baseline vbg showed an opening lactate of 6 uh, with no acidosis a ph of 7.42 and a bicarb of 23 his physical examination was otherwise normal and on upon percussion percussion his liver span was found to be 12 cm he was found to be comatose with a gcs scale of 8 his pupils are 2 mm bilaterally reactive to light uh, in view his outside lab showed um, i'm sorry his outside labs showed a hemoglobin of uh, 15 point hemoglobin of 15.7 hemoglobin of 15.7 with a urea of only 5 which actually shows a poor uh, liver function a bilirubin of 8.5 with a direct component of 3.9 ast of 944 and alt of 3400 his albumin was near normal of 3.3 and an inr upon presentation of 5.1 his ammonia was, was found to be 244 so in view of grade 4 encephalopathy he has undergone um, he was intubated and put on mechanical ventilation 
As per protocol, he underwent an NCCT of the head, which was suggestive of mild diffuse cerebral edema, as can be seen in this image over here. An HRCT chest was concomitantly done to rule out any underlying pneumonia or infections. And an NCCT abdomen was done in order to ensure that there is no other underlying liver disease in order to be able to assess the liver span, the splenic span, and also additionally to check the volumetry, which as we will see in the later sli slides is a good prognostic marker. My question here is if I interrupt you, Raki and uh, uh, Dr. Raki and uh, Dr. Ankar, Sir. obviously you have not commented, though you have written very boldly, optic nerve sheet diameter of 5.5 mm and 5.4, which also are more than the upper limit of 5. So that means we had the clinical evidence, as you rightly said, person is comatose. He is a normal glycemic. He probably also seems to be in a fluid uh, deprivation because collapsibility 50% with a very high HB, which is not expected. And very rightly, you have pointed out that uh, urea is lesser, which means probably there is an inability on the part of the liver to correct it. Please correct me where I'm wrong. I, I think that is very important because... And secondly, which a question which I have specifically for you, Onkar, and yes, I would sir. like to comment from uh, Dr. Raki is, so as a part of protocol for all acute liver failure patients which have come to you, is it a routine for all of you to do A, NCCT, chest, B, uh, uh, HRCT, when you have got a normal, uh, uh, let's say, 96% of room air, which is a normal one, and uh, even the VBG, if we look at it, we are finding saturation to be normal. So this is the venous blood gas. This is which fair enough. And it's showing a very high levels of lactate. And along with it, uh, NCCT abdomen. So that's my question is, is it a part and parcel of a protocol? And if so, the reason, and should we do it in all or in a selective group? I'm sorry for interrupting you right there itself. Because routine, most of the places, people don't do it. So I would like to have your opinion and review Dr. Raki also and Dr. Anka. So uh, I would say that initially over the years, uh, this protocol of doing a NCCT uh, of the head and the brain just to look at cerebral edema, because sometimes uh, these decisions becomes important in the setting, not of an advanced encephalopathy, but in a patient where the patient has come with an early grade of encephalopathy, where a CT, even though it is less sensitive, can give, give us a measure of cerebral edema. And we can discuss it later because that becomes a starting point for doing therapies to manage that cerebral edema if you're picking up in a lesser grade of encephalopathy. But over the years, with the uh, with the way we are seeing these patients who are coming up, uh, most of the times they come up with severe infections. Luckily, this patient did not have any pneumonia. But most of the times when we are receiving such patients, they're already infected. They're already in advanced encephalopathy. So normally we were just doing a CT scan, but over the years we had added a chest CT. And then because the NCCT of the liver was giving us so much information of the liver volumes, which again can be, uh, which is given us by the radiologist in a matter of 24 hours. And we'll discuss and we'll see the literature also of how volumetry also is very important in assessing which patients would actually survive without a liver transplant, prognostic assessment, management. So that's why we have made it as a protocol over the years while shifting the patient, a plain CT of the brain combined with a, a liver volumetry and a chest CT plus minus. But most of the times if the patient is going into the CT scan, we combine it because it gives us a lot of information. But because I did it not say of a trauma protocol. It that me it of is not, I would not say that this should be incorporated. We are in a very super speciality center and these are the set of patients that we see. That's how we have uh, incorporated, but the chest CT is absolutely should not be done for every patient. Thank you so much. But I, I think that's what I said. It reminded me of a trauma protocol. Yeah, sir. You're totally absolutely right, sir. So, so for me, optic nerve sheet diameter is very, very important for me because that again is showing that there is a probably a mark up to five millimeter. We take it as a normal, and also you are seeing here for me in terms of prognostication. I am finding it up. INR is too high. I, I, I'm very, un, uh, if I'm in quite an uncomfortable position with this sort of an INR, and I think CT probably here can also rule out intracranial bleed if sometimes yeah. somebody has it. So ammonia again is there. So obviously this patient has hepatic encephalopathy and severe hepatic dysfunction, right? So, so, so I will keep on interrupting in between so yes, that we so get that would more be very good. And uh, the lactates here also, the lactate is something which is very, very important. Uh, the initial lactate and the lactate post-resuscitation. 
both lactates mm-hmm. are very important and this is again what we'll be showing and discussing in this particular case right so um, so based on the history and the physical examination the ncct head the onsd and the lab parameters uh, we had two differentials in mind the first was acute liver failure with our primary etiology which we were considering at the time of evaluating this patient in the emergency being a viral etiology more because uh, this is the most common etiology which we uh, see in india apart from that uh, we had a second differential of an acute febrile illness or an afl alf mimic this was kept primarily because the patient had initially presented with fever and then followed by jaundice and um, encephalopathy so let's understand the basics of what alf is so alf is uh, nothing but severe liver uh, severe injury to the liver cells which leads to altered coagulation and mentation in the absence of any underlying chronic disease now this liver injury is defined by an inr of more than 1.5 it was initially described and defined by uh, o'grady and team back in 1989 and even today that is the most widely used classification system where we see that a hyperacute liver failure is one which occurs within the first week the duration between or the time interval between jaundice to encephalopathy is a week acute is when the duration is between 1 to 4 weeks and subacute is beyond 4 weeks up to 12 weeks the other Why is this is important because there is a very important this is a very important prognostic marker the patients who are hyperacute they come with very rapidly florid cerebral edema systemic inflammation but they are the ones who are likely to also improve very rapidly the acute and the subacute ones are the ones which have less chances of spontaneous recovery so these things are very important while we seeing these patients and uh, the jaundice to encephalopathy is something which is very important and should be recorded for each patient please go so uh, when we look at the differentials for alf our first was alf the second one was an alf mimic how to differentiate between the two is very important uh, especially on a clinical level so alf mimic is uh, usually has a fever as the predominant symptom and the fever in alf mimic coincides with jaundice onset and it persists even after the patient is icteric while that is not the case in alf hepatosplenomegaly is more commonly seen in an alf mimic uh, and not in alf in, in alf patients you usually find a liver which is shrunken because of uh, severe necrosis of the liver parenchymal cells liver enzymes in alf are found to be much higher and in thousands whereas in alf mimic it is lesser but in 10 up to 10 times the upper limit of normal coagulation shows an early derangement in alf and multi organ dysfunction and hemolysis is rare in alf patients so we started working this patient up once he presented to us in the icu and uh, the first line investigations that we sent were viral markers since that was our primary differential uh, his routine lab showed his igm anti hav to be reactive um, the rest of the samples that were sent for hev hepatitis b and hepatitis c were negative and uh, since we are in a tropical country uh, we evaluated for dengue and malaria which were also negative second line investigation since the patient had been referred to us and we wanted to save time we do not have time in order to go order wise but second line investigations for viral markers were As also the protocol sent. i would say in our institute we usually send until and unless the patient uh, has financial issues or says that limited test we go with the entire panel of alf test so that we are ready with the investigations uh, in the timely course okay go so ahead. rather what i could make out from this is that the first line investigations are mandatory whereas yes. second line investigation is an optional if i yeah. find them to be uh, my approach yeah. they are negative then i go for and look for an alternative yes sir and, and quite often we see that this sort of a pattern we also see in a tropical infections where you will have multi organ yes. plus you will have a liver transhepatitis or maybe sometimes jaundice predominant features i think that differential which you showed a uh, difference clinically between alf and uh, alf mimicers have been great i Thank think you. that's how we move okay so we found other uh, non hepatotropic viruses atypical infections to also be negative we routinely also performed a sepsis screen on this patient uh, which was normal which was negative so based on these primary lab parameters and the clinical diagnosis a working diagnosis of working diagnosis of hyperacute alf was kept 
with a jaundice to encephalopathy time of two days. The etiology was hepatitis A related and the King's College criteria was one by five, which we'll, we will be discussing in the subsequent slides. So King's College hospital criteria is one of the earliest prognostic markers, which was given to us back in 1989. The initial uh, uh, KCC criteria was given to us by O'Grady and team. And uh, this was divided into two based on the etiology, that is acetaminophen and non-acetaminophen. For acetaminophen, uh, the parameters that indicated or prognosticated a patient included a pH of less than 7.3 or a prothrombin time of more than 100 and a serum creatinine of more than 300 micromole, which would equate to about 3.5 milligram per deciliter in patients with grade 3 and 4 encephalopathy. For patients with non-acetaminophen poisoning or uh, non-acetaminophen infections, a prothrombin time of more than 100 or any three of the below variables, which can easily be remembered as A, B, C, D, E, that includes age of less than 10, more than 40, uh, B being bilirubin of more than 300 micromole, which equates to about 17 milligram per deciliter. Uh, C is a coagulopathy of prothrombin time of more than 50 seconds. D of duration of jaundice more than seven, seven days. And E of etiology, which is usually a non-A and non-B non -B etiology. Now, multiple uh, meta-analysis have been done, which have studied the sensitivity and specificity of this KCH criteria. And it has been found that for acetaminophen-induced ALF, the sensitivity of KCC for predicting mortality was 58% with a, uh, with a specificity of 89%. While for non-acetaminophen, the sensitivity was 68 and specificity of 82 now, the primary problem with KCC criteria is that it is a static criteria, which is measured as a at a baseline when the patient presents to us and does not take into account the dynamicity of the disease or the therapies that are provided to the patient. So this was further modified and uh, as per the uh, um, ASLD guidelines, which were published in 2011, the serum lactate levels, as we had discussed earlier, were also incorporated into this prognostic marker and uh, we can see that a serum art, uh, an arterial lactate of more than 3.5 millimole after fluid resuscitation is a strong indicator of a patient requiring liver transplant um, for uh, patients who do not have of a non-acetaminophen induced ALF the parameters pretty much remain the same so when we look at the other predictors of poor prognosis it was also found that etiologies such as acute hepatitis B or uh, uh, idiosyncratic drug injuries, autoimmune hepatitis, mushroom poisoning, Wilson's disease, Bacchiari, or any etiology which we were unable to decipher have a poor prognosis. Patients who come to us in the emergency with grade 3 or grade 4 encephalopathy also have a poor prognosis. Sensitivity as per ASLD tends to be, remain the same between 68 to 69 and a specificity of 82 to 92%. So we have looked at other prognostic markers apart from the ones that was initially given in 1989 and uh, CT volumetry was one which we have also found to be quite useful. Uh, initially, it was found that a liver volumetry of less than 1000 centimeter cube upon presentation predicts a poor prognosis uh, for patients and a need for liver transplant. A similar study was performed at ILBS and we had also found that a liver volume of less than 980 centimeters cube did mandate a transplant and showed a poor prognosis. One of the few dynamic scores that we have in today's date is the ALFED score, which, which uh, uses four variables, that is encephalopathy, INR, arterial ammonia, and the serum bilirubin levels, which are assigned scores of one to two. These scores are calculated on day, uh, day zero and day three, and a total score is then seen between for those who have a score between 0 to 1, the associated risk of mortality was low of 2.6. Uh, from 2 to 3 was moderate and 4 to 6 was high with an 88.5% mortality. Score of more than 4 should indicate a requirement for a liver transplant on day 3. Now, just I would like to interrupt this. The dynamic score, this is the only dynamic score uh, for non-acetaminophen ALF and this was developed from the Ames Institute and from a very large cohort of patients of predominantly HEV or viral etiology. And, but the only problem with this score is also, even though it is dynamic, the, in that era, the extracorporeal support therapies were not used. And the other thing was none of the patients underwent liver transplant. So 
those factors were not checked in the score but otherwise it's a very nice score very easily calculated at the bedside and for our patients also it was around 5 so that shows that this patient has to be counseled for a emergency liver donor uh, living donor liver transplant and all this why we are discussing is because once you see a patient with alf uh, in a live donor program the family needs to get some time to arrange for donors so while we are managing this patient, it is very important that we assess the need for transplant and tell in a timely fashion to the family so that they are able to get and find donors in the family because it's a very big thing and it's not easy for us to get the donors in time. So that's why all this is being discussed. So that is the first thing when you see a patient of ALF is assessing the prognosis and the need of liver transplant. And then you start your management and see the candidacy and how you make the patient fit for a transplant or you can save the transplant. So that we'll discuss subsequently. I think that is very important, Raki. You made a very, very important point. So all those people are working in intensive care, internal medicine, in the general medicine wards also. Probably we need to look into it. And now with the with the expansion of liver transplant facilities, probably we need to talk to the families earlier uh, in terms of the options which are available rather than having an elastic one. And, and I think it, it's just an excellent tool in prognostication and then talking to the family. Right. So um, we also have another prognostic score, which was developed at ILBS, and this is called the ALIVE score. So we found that KCH was not maybe helping us in um, advising LT or helping us decide who required LT right upon presentation. And we also found, uh, based on our data, that encephalopathy and liver volume were very important variables for the for de deciding the need of liver transplant. So in this study, we took into account these three uh, variables. And based on multivariate analysis, these were the most significant variables. And it was found that this ALIVE score was more or rather had a better prediction for mortality at baseline of 84.4% as, as compared to KCH, which in our study, in our population at ILBS, was only 66%. So, so the point which we wanted to make here, why do we need to still have scores? One is we need to have dynamic scores, uh, which should incorporate the changes in the parameters and see with which direction the patient is going and what happens if you change these numbers with the therapies that we are currently using. And the second thing is, whether etiology, so with the KCH criteria, this, the, the criteria, they, they are very, very specific. So if somebody meets the criteria, if our patient is not meeting the criteria. So it's very easy to say the patient needs a transplant if somebody meets the criteria, but a large set of patients, so the sensitivity is very poor. So a patient may not fulfill KCH criteria, but he may still be needing a liver transplant. So that is why it is very important that we should not just go by one criteria. We have to see the patient and we have to see what are the other markers of poor prognosis which is there and which are seen in these patients. So cerebral edema is something which is very important and which carries a very poor outcome. And we'll show with our data also, and this is what we found. So encephalopathy, advanced encephalopathy, which in 80 to 90% is associated with cerebral edema is a very poor prognostic criteria in patients with viral related AS. ALF. In fact, what you are showing us here, Dr. Raki, is that with an encephalopathy in liver volume, what you are talking in terms of using the protocol of CT for looking at the CNS as well as the volume uh, yes. justifies it, where you can have, uh, where you, you are predicting uh, far higher uh, with more sensitivity specificity, the, the mortality at the baseline. I think that the, this slide makes the sense what you have been doing. And what you have suggested. Yes, please. So after the patient presented to the ICU, an urgent transpa transplant consult was requested. The family was counseled regarding the need of transplant as a definitive management. The general management protocol that was undertaken for the patient uh, subsequently included uh, hydration with balanced crystalloids. There have been studies which have looked at uh, normal saline, balanced crystalloids, and albumin. And they have found that the incidence or the worsening of cerebral edema is minimal with balanced crystalloids and therefore should be recommended. Hemodynamic monitoring with a target map maintenance of 70 to 80 was undertaken. Uh, glucose drip was given to maintain an RBS between 140 to 180 milligrams per de uh, deciliter. 
Empirically, broad spectrum antibiotics were given uh, uh, to this patient in order to prevent infections uh, to avoid uh, any hospital acquired or ventilatory associated pneumonias. Patient was also started on a NAC infusion, which as per protocol was given at a dose initially of loading of 150 milligrams per kg over one hour, followed by 12.5 milligrams per kg per hour for four hours, and then 6.25 milligram per kg per hour for the next 67 hours. Now NAC primarily had been uh, used for patients of acetaminophen related liver injury, but uh, studies as we will show further have shown its utility even in non-acetaminophen etiologies. As far as the cerebral edema is concerned, which is our primary issue uh, when a patient presents uh, with ALF, for the cerebral edema, there were general measures of nursing care, which included a head end elevation of 30 to 45 degrees. We ensured that there was no unnecessary instrumentation or oropharyngeal suctioning that was done. The room, the patient was kept in a dark room to ensure minimal photic stimulation. And uh, uh, although we did not undertake therapeutic hypothermia for this patient, it may be used for patients with refractory cerebral edema. The patient was sedated and paralyzed as required. And um, during spikes of cerebral edema, IV mannitol or 3% NS was used. There have been there is a study from ILBS comparing the two, which we will get to soon. My now, question here is uh, my question: which sedation you use in these cases? Because now you are dealing with the most of the drugs have a hepatic metabolism. So what is the preferential in your ILBS in terms of sedation paralysis? You use uh, fentanyl and propofol sir, for such patients. So, so use propofol and fentanyl. Yes, sir. And wherever we require, supposing the patient has lung issues or pulmonary issues or severe pneumonia, there we add atracurium also. Atracurium. You use atracurium basically because that is a different way of mechanism than yeah. autolysis. It it happens. So, so, so the so-called Hoffman this thing. So, so, so that's why I wanted to know because uh, choice of uh, sedation also is important. So we we ensure that the patient should not move. So the patient has to be completely uh, means sedated or paralyzed if it is achieved with the uh, fentanyl or propofol. Otherwise, for such patients. And uh, how do you decide about mannitol in it? Are you doing an intracranial pressure monitoring? Or simply on the basis of the clinically whether person is uh, is uh, uh, in these cases having a de de uh, has a decortication, decerebration, or those things. What what you look at it? The basis of it clinically, he said. Whenever there are spikes, we give it. So mannitol. Uh, when we see most of these patients, when they come to us initially, initially we try and avoid because most of them are volume depleted. So we first ensure that they are appropriately volume replete. And in that setting, we look at the pupillary uh, signs, reflexes. That is the best measure for us. We do optic nerve sheet diameter measurements. And apart from that, we look at the hemodynamics, the hypertension, bradycardia. And uh, we'll show us, we actually rely a lot on EG also. It gives us a lot of information about the severity of cerebral edema. And so these are the four, five things which we use apart from the ammonia measurements. To guide, but for mannitol surges, when you say so, it is based on the hypertension, bradycardia. It is based on the pupillary. Uh, the there is an isochoria, or there are pupillary signs which suggest raise uh, arising cerebral intracranial hypertension. So we use mannitol in that setting. And finally, another question. Obviously, a lot of these questions will come up from the residents also, and my colleagues who are listening. Especially, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming from Indonesia. Now, my my my. my my question to you is, we are trying to maintain a blood sugar, obviously, on the higher levels. But when you're using a, a drip in this, we are using a 25% or 50% or we are using, because otherwise, if we use 10%, probability of causing edema increases. Absolutely right, sir. We never use 10% extras here. We use 25% as a routine, but patients who have severe hypoglycemia with that. So in that, we switch to 50% extras. So we try and maintain, but most of the times we're not able to achieve that set of sugar levels. But usually we see that we don't go below 120. That is what we target. My idea has been telling the people is that don't use 5% or 10%. If yes. you have to use use hypertonic uh, solutions of it, 25%, 50%. Otherwise, paradoxically, by using that, we can worsen it. Yes, sir. Totally. And under which condition here you use 3% normal saline instead of mannitol? 
three percent, sir. If I say most of the times, uh, we are not having patients where we need to use three percent, sir. But yes, if the so sodium levels we are not able to target with the use of CRRT, because when you're using all these therapies, most of the times your patient does not have these challenges of sodium. So even in the, if even with these therapies, if we start, if we get the problems, then we try and maintain sodium around one forty-five to one fifty. So that is our target, and if that is not met, obviously we use three percent normal cell. Right. Thank you so much. Yes, please, Omkar. Oh, Omkar, sorry, please. Yes. So uh, coming to the role of N-acetylcysteine and non-acetaminophen etiologies, there have been studies which have been done in the past. Out of these, we can see that there are four meta-analysis, one observational study, one systematic review, and one retrospective study. So as we can see over here in the studies with the larger cohorts, it has been found that uh, NAC in non-acetaminophen etiologies did improve the transplant-free survival and it in reduced the all-cause mortality uh, when it was given for about 72 hours. It was also found in these studies that it reduced the overall length of hospital stay and reduced the encephalopathy. So, cerebral edema is the most important thing that we uh, are Again, about. can I just interrupt on NAC? So NAC has shown a lot of benefits in counteracting the oxidative stress and repleting the hepatic glutathione, which also happens in non-acetaminophen ALA. But uh, the data from pediatric literature is there, which suggests that beyond five days, it can impair the hemodynamics and hepatic regeneration. So as a protocol, everywhere, even in surveys, it has been recognized that people use in the same protocol as for acetaminophen, and there is no benefit of extending an acetylcysteine beyond five days. So uh, coming to cerebral edema, which is the most important component that we want, we are trying to tackle when a patient presents to us in the, in the ICU. And uh, we have seen over here in these studies, uh, especially done from India, where uh, the predominant etiology of of, of ALF was a viral of viral etiology. It was found that patients who had cerebral edema had a, a lower survival of 13% and 18%, signifying that in these cohort or in these subset of patients, cerebral edema can signify the prognosis and long-term survival. So when there was a comparison that we made from the data that was uh, found that was generated from ILBS, we found that patients who had a low KCH criteria of say 0, 1 or even 2, but had cerebral edema, had a much higher mortality. So even patients who had who were not meeting any KCH criteria had a 25% mortality only on the basis of having cerebral edema. And therefore, it is understood that this is a poor prognostic sign for these patients. So coming to your question, sir, you asked about 3% uh, normal saline versus mannitol. There was a study that was done, which is the Mahal study, which uh, compared five, uh, which compared 3% normal saline with mannitol. 3% normal saline in their study was given at a dose of 5 ml per kg with a target sodium of less than 160. And uh, mannitol was uh, given at a dose of 1 gram per, per kg, as, uh, 6 hourly. And uh, they studied this in about 51 patients and they found that uh, there was a rebound increase in 20% patients who received mannitol and none with 3% NS. And it signified that uh, hypertonic saline was better than mannitol in reducing at least the events of uh, rebound cerebral edema. So this again, sir, was your question on how we monitor patients who have cerebral edema. And as uh, ma'am has already told in detail, we look at the pupillary reflexes, we look at the Cushing's reflex, patients can develop bradycardia, hypertension, signifying a spike in the ICP. We also look at the optic nerve sheet diameter, which is seen three millimeters behind the retina. Uh, and usually we have found that a value of more than six really correlates very well with uh, cerebral edema. Arterial ammonia levels, as studies have previously shown, more than 123 micromole per liter uh, correlates with cerebral edema in patients of ALS, ALF. Also, we have something called as a near infrared spectroscopy, which uh, shows uh, the oxygenation of the cerebral blood. Now, normal values for these are in the range of 60 to 75 percent, and anything below 50 percent uh, shows a poor oxygenation and uh, can signify cerebral edema. Although in our experience, NERS has not shown a lot of correlation with edema. 
EG, like we mentioned, also is a good uh, marker for uh, monitoring of cerebral edema and gives us an idea about how aggressive we have to be in our therapies. Transfer it tells us about non-convulsive seizures. So now we have actually 0% incidence of uh, patients getting uh, seizures. And previously we were seeing this incidence because prophylactic anti-epileptics is not recommended. So when we have added the EEG as a routine in the protocol, we can predict which patients are having severe cerebral edema and they should be given prophylactic anti-epileptics. So we are giving prophylactic anti-epileptics in patients who have very severe ammonia and have severe cerebral edema. So this is the same question, Dr. Raki, which anti-epileptic you are looking at? Levirisitam, sir. Again, the data is not there. It is only for phenytoin, but this is a new drug and this is supposed to be hepatosafe. So we're using levirisitam for our patients. And when we're using prophylactically, we just give it as a 500 mg twice a day, daily dose. So that's what most of the time people are using it in this. That's another thing which I want to ask from both of you. And is that when you're talking of arterial ammonia, how the sample should be taken and sent and how much time it should be processed? Because sometimes we see a lot of people are going through the different labs, give it to them if it is not done in-house. Uh, and what is the relevance of those studies? So this is another very important point that how the, uh, because there are arterial ammonia, we can also do venous ammonia. But what we are doing, we collect it from the, arter this, uh, the arterial line. So what it has to be ensured is that it has to be, uh, means there should be an ice on which the sample has to be sent and within a span of 30 minutes, it has to be processed, not later than that. Because ammonia it will evap means vaporize and the results are fallacious. So how it is collected and it has to be very uh, properly sent to the laboratory so that it is now we're trying to develop this ammonia uh, measurement in the ICU itself so that the time lapses of the uh, the test being taken up to the labs is also reduced. So ideally, it should be there in the ICU setting itself. That's why I ask, because a lot of time we do it and we send it, and later on the reports come after 24 hours, which have no value actually, and sometimes they don't represent the yes. point at what point of way we have taken up. So sampling, pre-analytical errors are very high. And we need point of uh, care ammonia test, which we're trying to develop as a part of research protocol so that yes. we have bedside, uh, we can check the ammonia immediately in these patients. Thank you so much. That's These are the practical challenges we face, so I'm putting those questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Go so another, another modality that we use uh, for assessing cerebral edema is also the transcranial Doppler, in uh, which we look at the pulsatility of the middle cerebral artery. And uh, the pulsatility index of more than 1.2 has been found to uh, correlate well with cerebral edema. So now with this background of this patient and the baseline general measures being undertaken for the patient management, a question we would like to put forth is what in your opinion would be the next step of management for this patient? Sir? You see, in this, obviously, at my center, I don't have an upfront LT. For me, it is easier to say bridging therapy until spontaneous recovery. I will go with that. But the centers where it is there, we have to start looking. At the meanwhile, we do bridge therapy, but we start looking at it, uh, as Dr. Raki said, uh, as a backup for the LT, for the liver transplant. That's how I will go with it. That is what we did, sir. So we told the relatives about a liver transplant. Go ahead. So as Sir has rightly said, the next step of management would be a requirement of an LT. The family was counseled regarding the same and they did identify four donors, but all four were unfortunately rejected. So now that LT has been ruled out at least for the time being in this patient until they arrange for more donors, how do we manage this patient? Do we go for a plasma exchange alone? Do we start CRRT? Do we start PLEX and then add CRRT or do we start CRRT and then add PLEX? Or do we go for molecular, molecular absorbent uh, therapies? So uh, we will discuss one by one. So all these are questions that keep coming up and uh, we actually don't have answers from randomized controlled trials. So the data for plasma exchange, which we'll show, is very exciting. And plasma exchange cannot be compared to CRRT because they are two very different modalities. So one cannot be compared to the other whether adding both the therapies is beneficial and which one should be given first. Again, that's an open question 
and we do not know answers to that. But how we do in our setting, uh, if the patient is a candidate for PLEX, so that means no active contraindication. Like in our patient, there is no sepsis, no pulmonary, uh, the, the lungs looks crystal clear. The We go ahead with and add, uh, we do a plasma exchange for all such patients. And depending upon the response to the plasma exchange, so here we expect that this patient is more likely to get more sessions of plasma exchange for recovery and also will need a CRRT. So because we are predicting that this patient has a high likelihood of going towards transplant, so it was not a simple case that has come early on and will improve with plasma exchange alone. So that's how we make a management strategy. And we do not consider CRRT as a first-line therapy. However, if the patient has already come with severe renal dysfunction, severe severely sick patient with pulmonary uh, with infections or pneumonia where you cannot do a plasma exchange, active sepsis, these are uh, straightforward contraindications. There we do not do plasma exchange and we go with CRRT alone. So, um, so okay. and Mars, I'm not sure which center is using because I think so it's uh, actually very costly and it is not useful for such patients. We do not use it. Raki, if I summarize what you said, Dr. Raki, is that if you are having, like the patient, having only liver dysfunction with the acute liver failure or hyperacute liver failure, then probably you will go with the plex. If person has got associated acute kidney injury, then probably CRT and plex can be combined. That's all I can make it up in a shot. No, sir. I was trying to say the patient we feel is more severe. So when we do PLEX, it is important that we, because we'll show you, sir, the ammonia reduction is not uh, very uh, encouraging with PLEX. And then PLEX is like just one-time therapy. So there is a rebound increase in the toxin. So you need some therapy in such patients where there is a severe liver failure for maintaining this and maintaining the cytokine uh, removal. So CRRT is as an add-on to PLEX is very helpful. And then you keep on doing your plex session because you can remove all sorts of toxins which accumulate in liver failure with plex, which you cannot do with CRRT alone. Right. So, Let's move ahead. Yeah. So as has already been discussed in detail, uh, what we went ahead for with our patient was a plex uh, followed by CRRT. So let us understand what the rationale of plex is in patients of ALF. Now, any acute insult that the liver faces, there is hepatocyte damage and death. This damage and death causes release of uh, damps, that is damage associated patterns, and also causes an inflammatory infiltrate, which leads to release of multiple cytokines and leads to inflammation. These are also then subsequently found uh, in the blood. And these are high molecular weight substances, usually of more than uh, 50,000 kilodaltons. These uh, dams and PAMs, the damage associated and the pathogen associated um, uh, molecular patterns and the inflammatory infiltrate are what ultimately cause the end organ damage in terms of cerebral edema, be it acute kidney injury or cardiac dysfunction. So the purpose of doing PLEX in these patients is to remove these high molecular weight toxins. So uh, that is how uh, plasma exchange helps by removing these larger molecules which are causing injury. So how do we decide how much of plasma has to be exchanged? So there is a formula for the estimated plasma volume. And based formula, the, uh, the volume of plasma that has to be exchanged is to be decided. The uh, replacement fluid usually that we use is uh, FFPs. And along with those FFPs, you may use normal saline. Now it has been found in studies that a one volume exchange causes a 63% reduction in these high molecular weight substances, while a 1.4 volume exchange causes a 75% reduction. A normal volume plasma exchange would exchange about five to six liters, while a high volume of about eight to 12. We have seen and ex uh, based on experience and as per studies, about two sessions done within the first 48 hours are usually sufficient for Patients of ALF who are responders, those who do not respond uh, within these 48 hours, again, this would also uh, warrant an LD uh, opinion for these patients. 
So when we look at the uh, prescription for a plex, along with knowing the plasma exchange volume, we also have to know the techniques. There are two that are used, which is one is a filtration based uh, and a centrifugation based. At our center at ILBS, we use a centrifugation based technique. And uh, the primary advantage of this is that it has a shorter duration time of about uh, two hours or 120 minutes and has a more efficient plasma re removal capacity of 80 to 93%. Citrase-based anticoagulation may be used, and that is associated with side effects such as uh, hypocalcemia, uh, which we are discussing further. Replacement fluids, like I've already discussed, is uh, preferred. FFPs are preferred, and uh, the advantage of this is that it has a lower incidence of post-treatment uh, coagulopathy, and also there's a reduction in incidences of hypofibrinogenemia. Now, one burning question that we always have to answer is how many sessions of PLEX? So, uh, unfortunately, there is not much data to assist us in this situation. And, and uh, most of these decisions are individualized and it is always a response guided approach. So we'd start with two sessions and we see how the patient responds and then we take a call on further sessions. INR and ammonia measurement eight hourly helps us in looking at any rebound rise in the INR or the ammonia, which signifies any ongoing liver injury. And that can help in a decision of a plex. A rebound INR, as discussed after two sessions, should warrant uh, a discussion of LT. So there are multiple studies which have looked at utilization of plasma exchange in ALF. Uh, one of the most recent uh, being from our center by Rakhimam itself, where we used normal volume plasma exchange in about 40 patients. And uh, these patients underwent uh, plasma exchange on a daily basis till spontaneous improvement. And it was found that the subset of patients had a higher transplant uh, free survival at day 21, which was 75% uh, of in those who underwent PLEX compared to 45% who did not undergo PLEX. Other studies have also shown, uh, which have undertaken low or high volume plasma exchange, have also shown a benefit with plasma exchange than without. So these are the uh, American Society uh, uh, guidelines uh, of 2019, which have shown that uh, high volume plasma exchange is a category one and grade one A recommendation for patients of ALF. And uh, this means that it can be used either as a primary standalone treatment or in conjunction with other modes of treatment. The high volume plasma exchange that is used targets about eight to 12 liters of exchange. So this is also another point which we've already discussed uh, as to why there is a requirement of addition of CRRT or uh, uh, other therapies along with PLEX in a patient with ALF. And that is because that in patients who are undergoing PLEX, it has been found that there is a poor clearance of ammonia, which is one of the driving factors uh, for the cerebral edema. So uh, these are two studies which have looked at um, ammonia clearance along, uh, with PLEX as a part of the seconds. There are no head-to-head -head trials and there has been found that there is some benefit of early initiation of CRRT. So at baseline, when we look at these patients, we find that the patients who have a higher SOFA score and lower platelet counts are more likely to be the ones who would require PLEX uh, further on in their uh, course of treatment. So our patient underwent four sessions of normal volume PLEX. Um, prior to his first session, we had seen that his uh, INR was uh, 5.1 with an ONSG of 5.1 and 5.4 and a lactate of 6. Post first session of PLEX, his values improved, his lactate improved to 2, his INR improved to 2.6. Enzymes are also reduced, bilirubin went up to 10.5, ONSG was coming down. Now, because his ammonia was still on the higher side on day 2 after his second session of PLEX and in view of ongoing cerebral edema, he was initiated on CRRT. Third day values improved further. The uh, ammonia clearance started from 278, went down to 250. Lactate came down to 1.5. ONSD was near normalizing. He then up underwent the fourth session of PLEX, uh, after which his lactates came down to 1.8 and INR of 2. Following the fourth session of PLEX, there was normalization of the INR, came down to 1.5. His lactates were normal at 1. Along with the CRRT, his ammonia had also cleared to 180. Plex was stopped and CRRT was continued for this patient. 
So as we've seen in the previous slide, there was clinical and biochemical improvement in the patient. Uh, sensorium uh, was assessed after a sedation break and the patient was following commands and was subsequently planned for a weaning trial. Now, after the fourth session of PLEX, we noticed that the patient had developed fever. Maximum temperature that was recorded was 100 degrees Fahrenheit, along with tachycardia and pulmonary infiltrates. Cultures were repeated, and his minibal culture showed the uh, presence of Acinetobacter bomani and Burkholderia. His minibal galactomannan also at the time was 3.2. So antifungals and antibiotics were upgraded uh, as per sensitivity patterns. So as we can see now, after this fourth session of PLEX, our patient has uh, developed a complication of infections, that is sepsis, which is very commonly seen in patients undergoing uh, PLEX. This is because along with clearing these high molecular weight substances, it also clears out the complement and it clears out other immunoprotective uh, uh, cells of the body and therefore reduces the immunity. Apart from that, other adverse effects that we do see with PLEX include hemodynamic instability. Uh, that is, uh, then apart from that, you can see volume overload, that is trali or taco. The reactions to plasma, such as allergic reactions, may be seen. Bleeding risk is lesser with FFV because the risk of hypofibrinogenemia is lesser, but it may be seen. Electrolyte imbalances, especially due to citrate, can be seen. Acid-base abnormalities and citrate toxicity. So in a study which was previously done for ACLF, it was found that a meld of more than 30 encephalopathy of grade 4, more than 2 organ failures, high lactate set presentation were poor were markers of poor response to therapy. For patients with uh, acetaminophen-induced ALF, a meld of more than 33 has been found in previous studies to be a marker of poor response. So over here, a lot of other side effects are also well taken in Kerarati to plasma exchange. So that's another benefit of doing this therapy along with it because all the acid-base abnormalities, electrolytes, volume challenges, and citrate can also be handled by using a uh, CRRT machine. So uh, repeat cultures which were uh, sent were negative. Patient responded to the antibiotic and, and antifungal course. On day 15, he underwent a tracheostomy in need of a prolonged uh, ventilation and prolonged hospital and ICU stay. He was kept off sedation and on a ventilatory weaning protocol. Now coming to another question, which unfortunately has been unanswered uh, due to lack of studies, is the requirement and how to manage a tracheostomy in ALF. Issues worthwhile discussing are the timing of a tracheostomy, which is early versus late. The method of, of performing a tracheostomy, be it a surgical and open tracheostomy or a percutaneous tracheostomy and the coagulation correction. Do we use a TEG or a rotem based uh, uh, correction uh, uh, protocol or do we go by INR and platelets and fibrinogen? Sir? Kunkar, I, I, I think these are the issues which are general across and one of the major challenges during this is uh, looking at the coagulopathy. That is what People are a little uncomfortable. So, so, so usually we see when things start stabilizing and when we find there's a challenge on an average between 7 to 14 days is the time period when in these patients we start looking at it. Otherwise, it's a standard practice that you do try winning, etc. Fine. Otherwise, most of the time now, 7 to 10 days is the period when we look for the trick. So that's, that's what the general practice is. And definitely we are now... Quite an experience at my center itself. We have done more than 1,200 PCTs. So we are far more comfortable and that has practically replaced surgical unless there is a contraindication to that. All right, sir. So um, on day 20 in our patient, after he had undergone a tracheostomy, he developed progressive hypoxemia. We had noted a drop in his PF ratios to less than 200 and his FIO2 requirement increased to 100%. Sedation and paralysis was reinitiated. A repeat set of cultures was sent. Because we were not suspecting infections, simultaneously an inflammatory panel was also sent. He was covered with broad spectrum antibiotics and sensitivity based antibiotics. So his inflammatory panel revealed a high CRP of 128 with the ferritin of 1500, and his cultures came back negative, including that of the mini ball. Um, he had progressively worsening PF ratios and therefore. Uh, he required one session of proning, which was undertaken for 16 hours. Now, negative cultures along with presence of uh, high inflammatory markers 
uh, in view of that he was start he received one session of a cytokine cytokine heme adsorption over and above this ongoing crrt two days later his pf ratios improved to more than 300 and his x ray also cleared up so the next challenge that we had faced in this patient was pruning now there is a scarcity of or rather a dearth of literature on this and uh, the issues that most of us are concerned about while pruning a patient of alf is number one the risk of bleeding they have coagulopathy so bleeding from the tracheostomy site is something that we are concerned about now pruning a patient with a tracheostomy tube is also another challenge because of the patient positioning and of course the risk of worsening of cerebral edema in the prone position is something that we should look at we don't have any literature on this sir so most important like for me in out of these things if you ask me on car and dr rakhi is cerebral edema uh, rest of the thing we have been handling and managing it they should not be a problem so but it's it's the worsening of cerebral edema and in fact intraocular pressures which are there because face gets a little down oh. so i think that's that's something we need to be very careful and in fact a cerebral edema is a contraindication for patient for prone but here patient had recovered luckily so we could prone him next that's true so a sedation break was given and a uh, weaning trial was given patient tolerated being weaned off the ventilator and uh, then subsequently he underwent a tracheostomy closure and was shifted to ward on day 27 and finally discharged from the hospital on day 35 so uh, this was the happy ending uh, for the patient with rakhi ma'am leading from the front we were able to salvage a patient uh, who would have otherwise required lt had a low liver volume had a second hit of sepsis and then a cytokine storm um, thankfully we were able to pull him through and he is doing well even today i think it's an excellent presentation of how to manage minus liver transplant and i, I think that's all we need to learn it because in most of the hospital it is any other stick so you you are predominantly a specialized liver hospital but nevertheless i think this sort of a cerarties are commonly available plex is being commonly done i think the only thing which is needed required is is a little more awareness about it and a little more alertness with which we need to work lucky excellent work by your team thank you sir a very short snippet if we have time otherwise we can take up uh, we can just run over the second case and we take up the second case no issue we have number of question answers but i still feel we have 20 25 minutes so we'll just go over that okay, a very different case of acute liver failure with a very different presentation very i think quickly. that is required that is required let the people have an idea yes. yeah i enjoyed it i learned a lot okay. ayush Good evening, everyone. So I will now be. You're echoing. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I will now move on to our second case for this evening. So this second case, uh, I'll just share my screen. So next case it uh, it is a very similar yet a very different case from the previous one so uh, this patient was a 30 year old male uh, with no prior comorbidities no uh, habits he presented to us with a history of fever for past 5 days which was initially high grade uh, was associated with chills and rigor and for this he took uh, paracetamol tablets approximately two tablets per day uh, he also had vomiting for last 3 days which was non bilious non projectile uh, uh, close to 6 to 7 episodes per day was associated with nausea uh, was not associated with any food intake uh, uh, and contained only ingested food materials he also had uh, reduced urinary output for past 3 days and was also having severe lethargy for past 2 days he also had history of outside uh, street food intake that i would uh, uh, like to mention over here so with these complaints he was initially uh, evaluated at an outside hospital where he had uh, high bilirubin uh, uh, and uh, he also had uh, uh, 
uh, high AST, ALT uh, in the range of thousands with a high urea of 98 and a creatinine of 6.54. He was tested positive for HAV uh, outside. Uh, he had an ammonia of 188 and an INR of 1.57. Uh, so, uh, based on this, uh, 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 a tentative diagnosis of ALF was kept in mind. Uh, so, when he came to us in the ER, he was conscious, oriented to time, place and person. He had a higher uh, mean arterial pressure with a blood pressure of 146 by 96, with a pulse rate of 88 per minute, uh, respiratory rate of 20 per minute. He had uh, a saturation of 92% on room air. Uh, his Q so far was zero on per abdominal examination. He had hepatosplenomegaly. His liver span was 16 centimeter. Uh, CNS examination revealed flapping tremors. Uh, so a possibility of uremic encephalopathy versus hepatic encephalopathy was kept in mind. So as part of uh, a routine protocol, a CT abdomen, chest and head was done. So uh, uh, a CT head did not reveal any uh, cerebral edema. His uh, CT chest only revealed uh, bilateral mild pleural effusion. His uh, uh, CT abdomen uh, revealed a liver, span, uh, a liver of 16.5 cm, which we usually don't see. We usually see a very uh, small liver in patients of ALF. So this uh, patient uh, had a rather uh, dif uh, different presentation. So his uh, initial ABG, despite severe renal dysfunction, uh, did not show any acidosis. His pH was uh, compensated. He had a bicarbonate of 23 and a lactate of 1.1. So initial clinical differentials that were kept in mind were acute liver failure with multi-organ involvement uh, with the uh, second possib possibility being acute febrile illness with the multi-organ dysfunction syndrome uh, with malaria, mods and uh, atypical HUS, TTP and systemic vasculitis kept down the line. So uh, he was initially uh, shifted to ICU, was started on broad spectrum antibiotics and was uh, uh, on supportive other uh, supportive medication. NAG was initiated. And he was planned for renal replacement therapy in view of uh, uh, uremic gastritis and uh, severe azotemia. Uh, his initial uh, hemodynamics uh, revealed a higher MAP uh, with a urine output of 20 ml per hour. His IVC was 16.5 and was more than 50% collapsible. His uh, initial lab parameters at our hospital revealed an INR of 1.63, a bilirubin of 6.7, uh, transaminitis with ALT more than AST in the range of 1000. Uh, with a high GGT and ALP, uh, with a urea of 115 and a creatine of uh, 7.59. His ammonia was also on the higher side, 187, but his sensorium was more or less intact. Uh, his CRP was also uh, a little uh, on the higher side, 258, and he tested positive for uh, HAV. So uh, he was uh, worked up uh, for, uh, so uh, during his workup, his uh, uh, other parameters came out to be negative. His uh, fever profile was negative. Uh, dengue, malaria, scrub and leptospira were negative. Other vi viral markers were, were also negative because he had multi-organ involvement. So we also uh, uh, did a, uh, a brief uh, uh, immune, uh, autoimmune panel, which uh, also came out to be normal. His initial 2D echo also revealed a normal study. Uh, so, in view of persistent fever and hepatosplenomegaly, uh, uh, HLH workup was also planned for this patient, uh, which uh, uh, surprisingly revealed a triglyceride of 654, a fibrinogen of 144, a very high ferritin of uh, uh, 5300, and an LDH of 968. His bone marrow subsequently revealed hemophagocytes. So, uh, his H score came out to be 228, which is uh, uh, which has a probability of 98% uh, being HLH. So, a working diagnosis of hyperacute liver failure, uh, HAV related with multi organ dysfunction, uh, was kept with the jaundice to encephalopathy time of two days and KCH criteria 0 by 5, with renal involvement in the form of uh, 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 rapidly progressing renal failure, likely due to immune complex mediated glomerular nephritis and extra pulmonary uh, ARDS, with secondary HLH syndrome, was kept as the working diagnosis. So, uh, so I will also now like to discuss ex uh, the common extrahepatic manifestations in the case of uh, viral hepatitis. So, we often see uh, patients of viral hepatitis with acute kidney injury, uh, e e calculus cholecystitis, pancreatitis, uh, pleural or pericardial effusion, hemolysis, hemophagocytosis, uh, and other less common things like pure red cell aplasia, reactive arthritis, skin rash, and neurological manifestations like GBS. But we uh, don't usually see these in our uh, clinical practice. The most common uh, of these is acute kidney injury and a calculus cholecystitis. 
so uh, yeah, the prevalence of aki in uh, avh uh, has been studied in the in the past and came out to be 1.5 to 7.6% uh, so the mechanisms of of uh, uh, AKI in a patient of viral hepatitis can be due to prerenal azotemia, it can be due to interstitial nephritis, acute tubular necrosis, intravascular hemolysis, um, bile cast nephropathy causing tubular damage, then immune complex mediated uh, glomerulopathy. So in uh, uh, most of the non-fulminant hepatitis A patient, 10 to 50% of AKI cases require renal replacement therapy. So the risk factors of AKI are male sex, older age, alcohol, concomitant alcohol use, and elevated CRP level of uh, higher serum bilirubin and high AST ALT uh, uh, levels. Our patient had a uh, CRP level of 258 on presentation. So uh, in a patient of acute liver failure, uh, these uh, damage associated molecular patterns and pathogen associated molecular patterns are responsible for tubular damage. Uh, uh, and subsequent uh, kidney injury. Uh, so in our patient, but uh, the immune complex mediated injury was more uh, predominant and uh, uh, because he also had uh, multiple organ involvement in the form of extrapulmonary ARDS and uh, concomitant renal injury. So a possibility of immune complex mediated injury was kept in mind. So we worked his AKI up and uh, uh, it was revealed that he had a UPC of 1.57 with the urine RBCs in the range of 45 to 50, although there were no dysmorphic RBCs, but uh, his urine RBCs were persistently in the uh, range of around uh, more than 30 per uh, HPF. He also had a high uh, uh, urinary albumin of 3 plus. Uh, he had a high bil uh, blood pressure of 146 by 96. So a possibility of glomerular nephritis was kept uh, likely immune complex mediated. Uh, so that was kept as our first uh, differential diagnosis. So the next next question that was there was uh, whether to uh, whether to uh, uh, start renal replacement therapy for such a patient. So uh, what should be the ideal choice of uh, renal replacement therapy in a patient of ALF? So in, in, in a patient of ALF, we usually prefer a CRRT. Why? Because uh, with CRRT, there can be biochemical and temperature control. The ammonia clearance is better with the uh, CRRT. The fluid balance is uh, uh, better with CRRT and uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines are better cleared with the uh, continuous renal replacement therapy. The but in our patient, uh, there is uh, he had uh, a higher uh, mean arterial pressure, and uh, uh, he did not have initially. Uh, did, did not, uh, have was not there on CT scan. Yeah, and uh, he did uh, not in have such any... patients. Uh, even though CRRT would still be very helpful because it will tackle the cytokine storm. And if you're saying that this is all immune mediated injury to different organs also, so. We keep debating, but our nephrologist uh, wanted us to do an intermittent dialysis for this patient. So that's what we did. But again, we don't have literature and which modality is better because the literature suggests that both are equal. But we'll show how both are not equal and how we do that the sled or the intermittent dialysis doesn't give us the benefits that we are expecting in these patients. So the available studies that we have are uh, uh, mostly historical studies uh, 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 that were published in 1978 and 1990, which showed CRRT better than uh, intermittent hemodialysis. Uh, the latest study that we have is uh, was published in uh, Hepatology in 2018, which showed CRRT to be having a better reduction of ammonia and higher transplant-free survival at uh, uh, 21 days. So, uh, based, uh, because uh, uh, the uh, the patient was planned for uh, a, slide, a sled, he underwent two sessions of sled on uh, day two and day four of his hospitalization. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, what, what was surprising was, uh, was there was not much reduction of uh, urea creatinine. His, uh, uh, there was a rebound increase in his azotemia and his urine output uh, was uh, persistently on the lower side. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, he also had uh, uh, respiratory distress for which he was initially initiated on HFNC ventilation, but he subsequently developed worsening of uh, his uh, respiratory distress on day five of hospitalization. His uh, chest X-ray showed uh, a worsening of bilateral infiltrate. So this was his initial chest X-ray, which uh, uh, which did not have. Uh, uh, there were there was uh, some uh, basal infiltrates, but uh, uh, he did not have uh, any. Uh, uh, his, he was maintaining saturation of uh, on uh, nasal prongs. So uh, uh, this was his X-ray done on day fifth of uh, hospitalization, which uh, showed uh, bilateral uh, chest infiltrates, which had uh, progressed over time. 
So the differential diagnosis, uh, uh, the differential that were kept in mind were bilateral pneumonia, likely, uh, with the second possibility being pulmonary renal syndrome. Uh, we also kept pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage and cardiogenic pulmonary edema as our uh, uh, other differentials. So he was uh, shifted to uh, intermittent NIV ventilation and was subsequently intubated and was uh, initiated on mechanical uh, ventilation. Uh, despite that, he had progressive worsening of uh, PF ratios with the uh, uh, maintaining a PO2 of around 68 or 70 on an FiO2 of 100%. So uh, uh, we uh, repeated a bedside 2D echo, uh, which uh, to our surprise revealed uh, uh, revealed severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction with global LV hypokinesia with an, an ejection fraction of 25 to 30%. We also did NT pro BNP, which came out to be 10,000 uh, and was subsequently uh, the next uh, 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 was in a rising trend and the next uh, report came out to be 21,000. His CRP was high, his ferritin was high. So what should be uh, uh, done in such a patient? So the possible treatment options for uh, refractory hypoxia, he had refractory hypoxia uh, in the way that he was not responding to 100% FiO2 and on uh, mechanical ventilation. So the possible options that we had were to initiate CRRT with the uh, ultrafiltration, to initiate uh, IV methylprednisolone, uh, maybe uh, he had an immune-mediated injury, to, uh, to prone him to try prone ventilation or to try ECMO. In, uh, he was a, a candidate for ECMO. So he was initially prone uh, and despite proning, there was no uh, improvement in his PF ratio. So, but his, uh, 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 his PF ratio is almost uh, stabilized after that. Uh, so sub, uh, so later after the, after proning, uh, as there was no improve, improvement, he was initiated on IV methylprednisolone in view of suspected immune-mediated glomerulonephritis, myocarditis, and extrapulmonary ARDS. He was also initiated on uh, cytokine heme absorption, uh, uh, which was followed up by uh, CRRT. So he received first dose of methylprednisolone, one gram, uh, uh, which was followed by 250 milligram for three days and also initiated on cytokine filter, followed by CRRT in view of hypocytokinemia and cytokine strong. And he was, uh, he, uh, he underwent a session of uh, 16 hours of proning. So post uh, uh, methylprednisolone, uh, there was a gradual improvement in his renal functions with the, uh, his creatinine stabilizing. There was a gradual increment in his urine output. His urine output, uh, which was previously in the range of 20 to 25, improved to 45. We did, uh, uh, we did a cardiac 2D echo daily uh, on a daily basis, uh, which showed an improvement in his ejection fraction uh, as uh, the days passed. Uh, on day nine of uh, hospitalization, uh, uh, his uh, uh, methylprednisolone dose was put on hold as there was a rise in lactate and a rise in the uh, procalcitonin level. So this was his, uh, his x-ray uh, prior to starting uh, the therapy CRRT and methylprednisolone. This was his, uh, his x-ray on day seven and this was his x-ray on day nine. So there was a slight worsening in the uh, chest infiltrates and there was a, a worsening of PCT. So we had to, uh, we had to stop his uh, IV steroids. So, uh, so what is the risk of infections with the high dose methylprednisolone in an ICU setting in a patient of acute liver failure? So uh, as we already know that acute liver failure is a, uh, is a condition of immune dysregulation. So we have to balance immune flare with immune dysregulation. So the role of empiric uh, broad spectrum antibiotics and antifungals is uh, uh, is uh, needs uh, mention here. And uh, uh, so what is what should be the duration of pulse therapy in such a patient? So uh, so it is usually response guided. Uh, we usually see the response of the patient on a day to day basis, and these patients should be uh, uh, under uh, uh, under uh, daily monitoring. And uh, the early diagnosis of infections is the key to manage such a patient. So, uh, uh, so for the course, uh, uh, he developed worsening of clinical condition on day nine, as I had already mentioned. So, steroids were put on hold in view of new onset sepsis. His uh, uh, mini bile culture sensitivity revealed Elizabeth Kingi, and his antibiotics were upgraded. And uh, steroids were reinitiated on uh, day fifteen of hospitalization. And he was the su successfully extubated on day 17 and was shifted to ward on day 19. His repeat uh, uh, chest x-ray on day 17 revealed a normal uh, chest x-ray uh, with uh, uh, a normal, he also had uh, a normal 2D co on uh, uh, day 17 of his hospitalization post the therapy.
so his uh, final diagnosis was acute liver failure hiv related with kch 0 by 5 with uh, secondary hlh syndrome and multi organ dysfunction in the form of uh, uh, immune mediated glomerulonephritis ards and viral myocarditis so with this uh, uh, case we come uh, uh, to a very important topic of hiv vaccination uh, status in india so currently only uh, uh, the hiv vaccination is only recommended for high risk individuals and uh, that also is a very uh, neglected uh, uh, neglected field neglected field we usually don't see patients uh, uh, taking hiv uh, vaccination and it is uh, although available as a single vant, uh, antigen vaccine or uh, as well as uh, in combination with hbv vaccine but we don't usually see these in our uh, clinical uh, clinical practice so uh, the key points in this uh, case are that uh, proning can be an alternative to ecmo uh, so the uh, atypical presentations of hbv infection uh, are there and uh, early recognition of the same uh, should be done the early initiation of therapies is the key to manage such patients and crt with the cytokine heme absorption can be a modality to manage extra pulmonary ards and there is an emerging need for screening and advocating the use of hiv vaccination in such patients thank you uh, thank you ayush i think it's again a very interesting case uh, which you have i have intervened in between so that we finish it off in time so we have number of questions but i have certain observations in it i think you can end your slide show uh, dr ayush Uh, please exit from the uh, uh, slide show. Yeah, no, thank you. So, so I, I I think there are a couple of things which I would like to say. Obviously, you have been able to pick up the secondary HLH, which is very important for us to pick up, and it is a practically life threatening. And it also tells us about there is an immune dysregulation, and predominantly that is your ineffective NK cells or natural killer cells of CD8. That's that's how it is happening, and the uh, presence of a liver and a spleen in acute fulminant hepatitis is a little unusual as you have pointed and these are pointing towards the presence of HLH and we need to look for an alternate diagnosis or sometimes malaria or leptospirosis we see. Now my the point is, uh, uh, I will come to it, obviously you have calculated the H score with the sensitivity spare practically more than 98% but out of those criteria, if you see 2004 criteria, there out of 8, 5 are there. So clinically, there is no doubt about it that he has that uh, hypertriglyceridemia, there is a hyper, uh, uh, your uh, ferritinemia, fibrogen levels are low, and along with you have a spleen, and patients have usually bicytopenia if it is there. So they have a very high mortality, and it's good that you picked up HIV as a uh, hepatitis C as a cause, because viruses, though it is commonly we tend to see with the uh, Epstein Barr or herpes group of viruses, but it can see with any tropical fever. My point here is that. You talk in terms of myocarditis, you talk in terms of glomerulonephritis, which is possible immune base, but it is also possible this may all be part and parcel of your, your uh, uh, secondary HLH. And this patient, probably there was a little delay in terms of, uh, though it is a very happy outcome, retrospective is here, because your options are very minimal. IVIG, you can't use it because patient has a renal dysfunction and you're using Plex and uh, or you're using the CRRT, so you can't use IVIG. So the only option which was left is either you use steroids, obviously hepatitis A virus, you don't have any other antiviral treatment to use the cause. Am I right? So, yes. so steroids was the right thing which was to be used. And uh, another thing to which I am little uncomfortable is, is that when you get a uh, uh, the, these uh, anti pro B and P's, because kidney is not functioning, these levels are going to be falsely high. But if you see the first X-ray, it was more looking like a pulmonary edema picture. So obviously, it will automatically take you to the myocarditis. And I think you did very well by using the corticoids. And that did respond. So my message will be that if you suspect HLH, treat the primary cause. And if it is a viruses where you have, let's say, antiviral, then you may use it. Like in influenza, you can use it. If you have, again, a group of CMV, you may use it. Or if you have a herpes group of viruses, you may be able to use it. But most important is to have quickly looking at your immune modulation. I think that's that's the things. And there is the first line you use IVIG. I think the other way I, I can simply put it is that it's a cytokine syndrome. 
which has happened to this patient. And what is very interesting component is that CRP, which is very high. If you would have done IL-6 or IL-18, or you would have done a, a soluble factor IL-2, which you call CD25, that would have given up an idea because that, that sometimes creates subtle differences between HLH versus mass, macrophage activation syndrome. They're part of the same disorder, but there's a slight differentials in terms of cytokine, but from there, more of a semantics. But in terms of management, what you've said and shown is, is important. Secondly, which I say is is, is a little, I know uh, the Elizabeth King say is we are finding much more with an automated systems. And, and uh, this is again telling you a significant immune suppression, which has happened in this patient, either because of altered cytokine storm, plus combined, you have combined it with the, with the, uh, with the steroid therapy. So my to my audience, which is there, and a large number of questions are there, I will just... So so, so I am not too fond of doing anti-pro-BNP with the renal dysfunction. What is more important at that point of time is all right, if you understand it, that you do. But I think it is all manifestation of secondary challenge, which has been affecting multi-organs. And, and obviously, immune complex disease, if it is there, you will have an evidence of glomerulonephritis. Right? That's all my assessment is, Dr. Raki, what's your need? And then I will quickly ask a couple of questions which have been asked for you people to answer. So you're absolutely right. Uh, actually, in this particular patient, our thing was whether we are seeing this ALF in an early course and he will slip into that ALF condition. He may go into cerebral edema. So our challenges were there. And then very often what you see in these patients, you see ATN more often because he was hypovolemic. And still, like you're saying, he had some evidence of uh, bilateral pleural effusions, which suggested a capillary leak syndrome. And that was suggested with the very high CRP levels. That's why if you ask me, I wanted to start him on early CRRT rather than doing sled and wasting time. So those things were there. So I don't know whether we're right in uh, doing upfront uh, cytokine adsorption therapy because the time, sir, we take to decide on methyl predators like HLH in liver patients with a 5,000, that was the only weird thing which was bugging me was the ferritin was just 5,000. Normally in such an HLH, you expect ferritin to be quite high. If the ferritin would have been very high, I would have been very confident in upfront starting because very often in acute liver failure, you see secondary HLH, which is like you don't need to treat that HLH with steroids because... It's a part and parcel of the liver failure. So that's why we do as a protocol, we do bone marrow for every patient because we see high ferritin and all these markers. Triglycerides in the ALF, not in the ACLF setting, but in the ALF setting, usually we see higher side only. So therefore, for every patient, we cannot. So we try and see and confirm with other findings. So in this patient, the fever history, the hepatosplenomegaly, then the other features of uh, HLH, and therefore, we were thinking of different diseases, whether the HAV has just triggered an autoimmune, it's a false positive HAV. There were a lot of differentials that we had for this patient because of the multisystem organ involvement. But uh, clearly, this was HAV with a predominant extra hepatic and like you said, a secondary HLH syndrome. And that's why in liver patients, we do CD25 that is done, sent to the laboratory. But unfortunately, the results don't reach us by the time the turnaround time of those reports is very slow. So that is one problem and that's why we don't do and the test is very costly. It co costs around 15,000 to the patient. That's why we avoid doing in such patients. That's true. That's true. I'm not saying it because it is in hindsight, it becomes very easy because when things are evolving prospectively, yeah. it, it's not as simple as it looks like because that's what I'm wondering because you have multiple organ dysfunction which has happened. Yes, sir. Yes, so sir. it can happen as a part of it. But now looking at it, I think it was the steroid which did the trick. We kept as a possibility Taka Subo, sir, in this patient, I don't know whether I'm right because I felt because he went uh, he went into shock and hypoxia and then he had this cardiac dysfunction. We don't know whether it was inflammatory or it was something we... And NT-Pro BNP, like you're saying, very rightly, uh, it is not... We don't use it as a diagnostic marker, but we use it as a marker of prognosis to understand we're handling the inflammation well and the... Uh, course well. So we combine it with an echo wherever possible in such difficult cases. I understand that what you are saying, you are looking at the mark of it. For me, if you look at it, because if we use CRRT or we use a plex, 
again, this, this is a very common thing when you give CRRT, you tend to see the BPs coming up, cytokine, then you stop it up, again it comes back to the same. So I think the treatment of underlying disease is the key and the magic in your case has been the corticoids, which have done the, which have done, you see, it is a cytokine syndrome. It's a cytokine syndrome. That's what we saw in COVID also. So, 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 so macrophage activation syndrome or HLH, whatever you want to call. So there is a slight differentials in terms of your, uh, uh, if you see it, uh, uh, in terms of you will have IL-6 and uh, uh, CRP levels will be a little low in the macrophage activation where it will be very high in HLH. So, so we know the cytokine profile because IL-6 and that will have the same one. So I do agree with you and, uh, and, and that saved it. As far as Takasubo is concerned, I call it, everybody calls it a broken heart syndrome. So, <laughs> so there will be, echo is very specific. It will be a acute dilatation and you will have a protuberance. So, so it is more like an electrical heart. Mm -hmm. So that is what you see. So, so, so that's, that's most of the time associated. I put that as a stress induced myocarditis. Septic myocarditis in any case is, 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 is all part and parcel of it, which has been responsible. But I think it gives an example that with the same organism, people have a different immune responses and they can present differently. You have raised a very important point of uh, HIV, uh, uh, hepatitis C-related uh, uh, vaccination. Usually it is expected that in our country, majority of the people, by the time they become adult, have uh, have uh, HIV antibodies against HIV. But of late, we have also seen a couple of young people coming with it. Now, with this background, I have a couple of questions. People have asked, can dexatomidin be used as sedation? 29 questions are there. I will quickly go through that. Some of the answers already are there. So I just wanted to know, can we use dex into it or not for sedation purposes in patients of liver dysfunction? I can uh, just allude my experience of using dexmed. Very recently, we've started using in patients of alcohol associated liver failures who have uh, alcohol withdrawal where we're trying to wean them and putting up and other patients of ACLF where we're putting but in ALF particularly we haven't used dexmed because here if the patient recovers it recovers so either they are off sedation they are on complete sedation so most of the times dexmed we've not used in ALF but yes other severe liver failure patients and it's not a problem it's a safe drug that's that's one number another question is from Mr. Kapel Dr. Kapel what is your opinion about filters used? What's take home message for using filters? So I would suggest that uh, not to use for every patient, but whenever we are planning in the very severe cytokine storm as an adjunctive therapy to CRRT in the right phase of the disease. Once we the, st the storm has set in, there's no point in using these expensive therapies. So very proper choice of patient and in select patients where your cytokines are not handled with CRRT, they're an adjunctive treatment and you cannot give corticosteroids because of the risk of infections like we had in our previous patient. So there it is very helpful. Another question is any role of IL-6 inhibitors in this patient up front instead of pulse steroids or later on down in the line had the patient not responded to pulse steroid suspecting capri leak? So practically he's asking about tocilizumab and all. Yeah, so IL-6 inhibitors are contraindicated in liver patients. That's why in COVID also, what we were seeing liver patients with COVID, we hardly had any experience of using these drugs. Please give your insights on toramycin, toramixin versus cytosol. Toramixin, if I have to use, I will never use for such patients where I'm suspecting severe inflammation is driving. Uh, there I would go with cytosol because... Toramixin is endotoxin specific. So whenever you're dealing with a severe gram negative sepsis, there is where your toramixin filters is going to help. But wherever you're dealing with the inflammatory storm or cytokinemia, there obviously your cytosorb and these other therapies which handle these cytokines is important because toramixin will not help that. There is another question from ARO Rian from Indonesia. I am Awan from Indonesia. What are the key factors contributing to the development of acute liver failure and what distinguishes it from chronic liver disease in terms of symptoms, prognosis and management? Yeah, so acute or chronic main, liver failure if you are having it. main thing is that acute liver failure patients, the main thing is that we need to remember these are very young people. They have a healthy liver. They, they were hardly having any disease or any risk factors and they just land up 
with an acute insult where the patient goes into uh, the syndrome of liver failure. While when you have risk factors and predominantly elderly age group where you already have some features of chronic liver disease, and there if the patient is coming with an acute insult driving liver failure, most of the times these patients have acute on chronic liver failure. And on clinical, uh, if you see the clinical signs and symptoms, the most important thing is these patients are never deeply jaundiced. ALF patients will go into cerebral edema before they get deeply jaundiced, but ACLF, you will see they are deeply jaundiced, ascites will come up, and encephalopathy is rather very late event in most of these patients. So these are the findings which can help us clinically to differentiate ACLF from ALF. Another question, Aki, there's a line of it, is uh, how to manage cerebral edema in oliguric acute liver failure patient? Oliguric, I would suggest that, yes, the best option is to go with CRRT. And uh, again, as I said, the plasma exchange is much more beneficial. If we can add on CRRT, it gives us much more benefits. So wherever possible and the patient, we can choose our patient for plasma exchange, add plasma exchange. Oliguria is not a problem of using plasma exchange. There is a, another question which is there. It's practically full of it. Uh, one another question is antifungal choice, azoles versus amphotericin. So uh, for ALF patients, what is recommended and what we practice is that whenever the patient has gone into grade 4 encephalopathy, it is important that we give them a, a proper coverage for antifungals. Echinocandins are the first-line treatment. And wherever we are suspecting an invasive aspergillus, obviously amphotericin has to be given timely because most of these patients are very, uh, they have a very high, li high likelihood of developing invasive fungal infection. So echinocandins, I don't use as well, particularly because of the other hepatotoxicities and, and uh, the non-albicans candida are not covered by as well. So. so there are a couple of more questions. They just give me a time. I think my is just uh, hooked it up. But... Uh, what are the additional challenges you see? So what is the time when you go for the liver transplant? And how is the success rate for the liver transplant in these patients? So I said the first go itself, we have to keep the first assessment is whether the patient needs a liver transplant. And mm. then the entire plan of management should revolve around that decision of whether you have to bridge the patient to liver transplant or you can avoid a liver transplant. So this is the most important question that has to be assessed by different prognostic ways and assessing the patient because that's the ultimate savior still in 50 to 60% of these sick patients and should be performed timely. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I, you, you can see certain questions also on your this thing uh, because yes. I was facing some challenges in yes. my... <laughs> There are quite a few more which are there. So they're asking two sessions of flex, whether it should be low volume or high volume. So we do an in-between volume. We do a standard volume, which is not very high volume, but it is not a low volume flex. So we do 2 to 2.5 volume exchanges for most of our patients. And it works quite well and has limited complications. Then uh, somebody had, okay, one second. IL-6, we answered. Maybe Coagulation maybe abnormalities. If you go up. Uh, coagulation, up. most of the times, INR should not be thought as a marker of poor coagulation. What we see, we do routinely uh, the point of care test. We do Rotem in our, at our center. Even with high INRs, you see these patients are hypercoagulable. And the most common coagulation abnormality that comes in first is a fibrinolysis. And if you see that your fibrinogen levels are low, then these patients have very severe, very deranged coagulation and they can bleed. So you have to be careful while doing any intervention. But if the fibrinogen levels are preserved and the patient doesn't have any fibrinolysis, most of them are hypercoagulable. And despite a high INR, safely you can put lines without correction. And you can uh, do place your dialysis catheters or whatever th therapies you want to perform, in in interventions you need to do. There are a couple of more, uh, I think one or two, but most of the questions you have already answered. 
what is the best model for me what is the best treatment nobody knows the best treatment as of now is still the liver transplant for acute liver failure uh, but yes this is one disease where you can reverse the syndrome completely so all efforts should be made towards identifying the patients who can be bridge to spontaneous recovery because then you're giving them actually not a new liver and a new disease but a new life altogether and then from my side the question is suppose it's a hepatitis b do the uh, does the antivirals have any role there so antivirals should be given even though there the role of antivirals you don't see any benefit because most of the times this is mostly an immune mediated process the viral levels vi these patients are not very viremic but antivirals have to be given as a protocol and uh, when they are taken up for liver transplant it has to be continued also right thank you so much uh, rakhi i think you have clear it, it, it's it's a treat actually i learned so much today and uh, and uh, and i hope the youngsters both of them uh, omkar and uh, ayush have also enjoyed it and so have been the audience thank you so much thank and you, for uh, for uh, agreeing to our request thank you so much again once again okay good night and sir and we are 15 minutes again it's still the number of it and i am certain okay. our friends from indonesia from malaysia and also from sri lanka who have come up and joined us have enjoyed this session you can see the expertise uh, which is there at uh, ilbs and no wonder uh, rakhi i think you people have been doing a fabulous job i know otherwise also being uh, constantly in touch thanks a lot thanks a lot again thank you thank you sir thank, thank you. you sir thank you thank you dr dhruv uh, definitely thank you dr rakhi and entire team dr ayush dr omkar it was really a uh, superb discussion rather a good engagement on uh, acute liver failure sir we assured once again to meet uh, and reconnect all our viewers and listeners also on 15th march on our 14th pulse of critical care episode till then thank you so much to all of you once again stay safe good night thank sir you. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Good thank night. you very much, man. Good night. Thank you, Rashi. Thank you, Omar, and thank you, uh, Ayush, and thank you, Parish, and all of you. Thank, thank you, you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you sir. Prasad. Good night. Thank, thank you. Sir. Thank you. Bye. Good night. I enjoyed it. Yes, thank sir. You. We can yes, close sir. the session. Yes. We can sir. close the session. Yes.